Welcome to Story Strategy Live. This is episode 17, Making Readers Care. And we have a special guest today, author Melanie Harlow. Hi, there she Hi. is. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Dawn. Hi. So um, I have known Melanie for a while. We, I don't even, I guess we met on the internet. We're like a match.com couple from way, way back. We, yes, you <laughs> out to me after you read my very first book. And you were one of like five people who read that book. And it was so, <laughs> so I was like an early book stalker. So I've loved you ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've come a long way since, was that speakeasy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was um, seven years ago this month. Holy moly. I know. Wow. And how many books in seven years? Um, I get a little confused about this because I have two co-writes and I have one novella, but I think it's roughly like 25 full length titles somewhere in there. And at least one of those is a USA Today bestseller. So that's pretty cool. I would, I think like maybe four or five of them. Um, I had, I had a window of time where I was wide and it was possible to hit the list um, that I had reached a good enough level of sales to to hit that list and it was really fun that's awesome <laughs> yeah well today, yeah, uh, in, I, I also love being in kindle unlimited even though you can't really hit a list while you're while you're in it but i i i like being in that program the readers are pretty voracious in there especially for romance yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well we're gonna ask you some some hard-hitting romance related questions today <laughs> <laughs> very probably, serious and yeah, they probably won't be that hard hitting but um what's going on first i guess dawn says that i have forced her to tell a funny story for the last two weeks so i'm on the spot unless do you have a funny story melanie harlow <laughs> no. I'll, I'll just push the spot no um, <laughs> no i keep i really don't these are the things that should be planned in advance. That is what I'm learning. I have had a day. That, that will be my funny story. I've already got a glass of wine. It's actually a spritzer, so you don't have to worry about me getting loopy. Um, <laughs> but this, I'm like, I feel like I'm previewing what's going to be happening when my kids start online school in a couple of weeks because they are like roaming around the house like ghosts with like nothing to attach to because I won't let them play Call of Duty for eight hours a day. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, are, are they going back 100% online? No, they're not. Um, they could. I live in Douglas County, Colorado, and they just decided that we're doing, um, we have an option of a hybrid model, which will be two days a week in person, two, and then I guess three days virtual, or 100% online. So because we just moved here and my children know absolutely nobody and have no friends at all here, um, yeah. <clears throat> we're sending them to school. So. It's a hard choice. Everybody has to do what they think is the right. Right now, we don't have a hybrid option. We have 100% in school or a 100% online option, and I don't know what to do. That was what they gave us first, and then I guess enough parents were like, "What the?" And so yeah. they went back and rejiggered and. And decided. Michigan, I know, is we're <laughs> seeing an uptick in cases, so I'm waiting for them to announce. Apparently, there is a hybrid plan that they could. It's in place, but it wasn't really. It was confusing. I'm confused. That was exactly where we were a week ago. They said yeah. the same thing, um, that they, they had one just in case this happened or that happened. And I guess whatever it was happened. So that's where we are now. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm right outside of Dallas and they have told, we had three options too. Of you can do some classes online and some classes in person, online only or face-to-face -face only. And then... Today is Thursday. So Tuesday, they came out and announced, oh, nope, we're going online only for the first three weeks. Ah, yeah, it, so. I've heard of that one before. So three weeks. I mean, they'll probably extend it. All I keep hearing is if these kids go back to school 100% face to face, we will shut down within two weeks anyway. So right. like, why are we why are we doing that to these kids and to families? I just, yeah, so hard. Anyway, I interrupted the funny story with this. That was pretty much the funny story. I, I've got nothing. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> um, yeah, it is what it is. I think, though, it probably people aren't tuning in to hear me tell a funny story anyway. So we'll just let let non-sleeping dogs lie. My puppy <laughs> in front of me gnawing away merrily. So um, 
but we're going to talk, we wanted to talk to you specifically um, because we do get to edit for you a little bit. Um, and so I have read, I I want to say all of your books. I think you probably have. I mean, I, I haven't had any other editor in like five years probably. Well, and the ones I didn't edit, I read anyway. So I think, I think it's safe to say I've read them all, but you have a knack for gaining the cares like the you really pull readers in within the first few pages even i would say arguably maybe the first page and make them care about something on that that has to do with your characters um so we wanted to drill down a little bit into how do you do that and is it a transferable skill that you can help other writers learn i think yes because i certainly um picked it up from either other authors that i really liked and also from a couple of the craft books that I'll talk about as um, really great resources. Um, but first, I wanted to tell you that when you told me what the topic was going to be, I immediately panicked and was like, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know how I do it. And um, doesn't everyone? Like, I, to me, like, I feel like everybody does that. So I went to my beta readers. I'm like, you guys, I'm panicking. I have to go on live. I have to go on the internet and say how I get readers, you know, to, to have feelings when they're reading. And I, what, what is it that sets my stories apart? And, um, and what they said helped me kind of get focused for this. And I realized, okay, that is sort of a conscious choice. And what they said was, it comes down to um, character and um, feeling like these are people that they know they're people that they connect with. They are people that um, sound like their friends, like themselves, like their family, um, like that they, they're just people that they would want to know. So, and I think that um, that was a conscious choice for me to write about average everyday people. I don't write the billionaires or the rock stars or, you know, um, the pirates. <laughs> vampires. And there are authors that do that really, really well. But I knew that that wasn't going to be me. And I think that that might help readers that are reading my books and really connecting because they, those characters feel so n relatable, knowable, approachable. Um, and then the one resource that I really, really love is called um, Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hayes. And I, I love don't have a physical copy. So maybe if someone does, yay, <laughs> yay there it is. <laughs> My coffee is, is digital, but I've read it like a million times. And I made this little like four box structure thing of notes <laughs> when I read it. And, um, but she's very clear in when you're first setting up right from chapter one, that slice of life, it's kind of the before picture mm -hmm. and you immediately want to bring the reader in and kind of explain what's wrong. Why are they stuck? Why, what's the hole in their life? It's never what they think it is, but it will kind of become obvious as the story goes on, but something is wrong. And I try to make that something really relatable. Um, you know, because again, these aren't, rock stars and, and billionaires. This is, you know, they're wedding planners or mechanics or an architect or, you know, bartenders. Um, and that was also a conscious choice because the romance author that I really, really loved growing up, what I used to steal my mom's liberal Spencer books. <laughs> and I'm still to this day, I reread liberal Spencer all the time. Some of it is a little bit outdated, but my favorites are historicals and they are not. Um, and she was kind of known as being um, a, a writer who was one of the first to write blue collar heroes. And I, and I always was like, what? People weren't doing that before? Like I was a little bit too young to be like of the, the flame and the flower era of romance. But um, so I never really got into like, you know, the lusty dukes or whatever. <laughs> so, but I was, you know, reading about it, liberal Spencer and, um, her, her books just had like average everyday people, but they were sexy. They were hot. They were great love stories. And you just got drawn into them because you felt like, oh my God, that could be me. That could happen to me. Definitely. Um, well, and I want to say about you talking about making these look like real people and making them relatable. Um, I read Irresistible 
which the first chapter of it starts off with Mac waking up and he's thinking about how he just wants a morning where all he has to do is all he's got to do is lay in bed that he can just, or he can do whatever he wants. And my children are older now, but I have a a boy and a girl that are 12 months apart. Oh my. And I so remember those days because they were little forever. (laughs) And I still remember waking up and thinking, I just don't want to move. And you know, like somebody's fixing to come jump in the middle of the bed. Somebody, mm-hmm. you know, somebody's going to knock on the door. It's going to, somebody's hungry. Something's going to fall in the kitchen because they've decided to fix themselves breakfast, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. That's so like the ultimate to, relatable. Yes. And, yeah. My kids are older now. They're 12 and 14. But when I was first writing, so like 10 years ago, so before I even published anything, I used to have to get up at five and I would write between five and 7 a.m. And I used to know the exact stairs that would creak and the spots on the wood floor. And I, it would be like this twister, like contortion thing (laughs) down the stairs without making a sound so that I could have those two hours to myself. I I just dreaded when I would hear that mommy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Um, so yeah, that, that's something I think that's relatable. You just want a morning to yourself. Right. Starting off right off the bat with that, the reader thinks, oh my God, I know what it's, I know what that feels like. I I know this guy. Well, and that's, I think that's a good example too, especially because it's maybe easier for women to write relatable women, but that parent, you know, if you're a parent, that feeling is universal. And so I think maybe it's a little tougher and I don't know if you can hit on this at all, to write relatable male characters because our readers generally are are female Mm -hmm. and they want, you know, the strong, some, I mean, I I don't write alpha and you don't really write alpha either. I wouldn't say. We have alpha moments, but I I write good guys. Yeah. And so making a good guy, a hero (laughs) can be, can be a challenge maybe. So how do you, what are your tricks for making really relatable male characters when they're not parents? So, Interestingly enough, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but I find the men much easier to navigate in terms of character than the women, only because I think, um, like you said, our readers are female. I think they are more willing to forgive things of a of a male character. Writing a, a writing a heroine is a tricky balance of being strong enough to stand up for herself but also fragile enough to, you know, be, be vulnerable. And, um, you know, no one wants a doormat. No one wants too stupid to love. Um, but if she's so strong and tough and so badass, she, you, you lose the relatability. No one's going to connect to that, to that woman. I mean, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, no, um, that makes sense. So I never write a woman that has her shit together pretty much. Sorry. If people's kids are in the room. Um, there's always like, even if I have a great job or things going, there's always something. They're either just barely holding it together, <laughs> holding on by a thread, or they, um, you know, there's something that they want that they just can't get. Um, but the guys, I feel like, like I said, I write good guys, and usually the reason that they like are not interested in love is because either they've been burned before. Or, you know, they, if they're a single dad, that's the, a conflict right there. Um, I've written a widower. Um, so, but it, usually for me, it's easier to have that internal struggle in the guy. Um, I don't know why it's easier, but, but my, I feel like it's more believable maybe that a guy would be less reluctant to let down his guard. So I find it very easy to write gruff, sort of nice guys on the inside, but they put, they've put they put up walls for whatever reason. And that kind of character really intrigues me. Yeah. And kind of gets my creative juices flowing because I'm like, well, what happened to him? And um, and I can talk about this too. There's There's always something that happened to him in the past that made him build those walls in the first place. Um, and I, I have to know what that is before I even start writing the book. Um, 
So, and I want to get at that and I want to dig at it and I want to make him, I want to force him to, you know, let down his guard a little bit. And of course it's going to be the heroine that forces him to do it. And he's going to kick and scream and throw tantrums and say really terrible jerk things to her um, because he's scared, but he's, he just won't admit it. Um, so I find that really fun, fun to write. And also, if I don't know if any of my readers are watching this, they're going to be like, that's not true. But I have also found over the course of 25 books that my readers prefer it when it is the guy, the hero who has the most trouble committing. And it, in the end, at that, you know, at that 75 percent breakup that Gwen Hayes tells us has to be there right around 75 percent, he walks away. He's the one that chooses fear over love and builds those walls back up and says, I'm out. You know, I thought I could do this, but I can't. I've written it both ways where it's the heroine at that point who walks away and the hero. And for whatever reason, and maybe it's me, maybe I just write a better book when it is the hero walking away. Maybe I write a more compelling breakup scene and long dark night afterward when it's the guy, because that's, it's, I, I feel like I, I know that guy. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I, my readers seem to prefer it that way. So I, I, I try to stick to it when I, when I can. Yeah, don't mess with what's working. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I have more questions, but I feel like I've been hogging. So Dawn, do you have a question or two that you want to I don't know. I'm just soaking it all in. I'm like, okay. oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, okay. So you talked about that. You have to know what was, what went wrong for them. Right. Right. So tell us, tell us about how you get to that and where that comes from and yes. how you dig around in there. So I'm a huge um, believer in the emotional wound approach to a character. Um, and I don't know who like came up with it originally, but um, Gwen Hayes talks about it, and I'm a really big fan of Michael Haig. His um, storytelling or storymastery.com, I think I, I, the website, I think I sent it to you somewhere, but um, maybe we can put it up in the comments or something. Yep. He has a lot of videos and um, like lectures that he's given talking about this emotional wound. And then there is a website call, called, it's like the One Stop for writers and they have an emotional wound thesaurus, which is the most, oh, look at, there it is. I know, isn't that cool? <laughs> I always get so excited. Oh, magic. <laughs> you guys, I just poofed that into existence. <laughs> I thought it, it was the next one and, and we'll put that up. Wow. <laughs> Can you make a martini appear right here for me? <laughs> uh, my, my skills are limited. <sighs> Um, but so the one stop um, for writers has a, an emotional wound thesaurus. So if you're like thinking like, well, what could this character have gone through? And basically what the wound is, is something happened to this character in the past. Often it's something from childhood, but it doesn't have to be. It could be something like a divorce or um, getting dumped or left at the altar or even losing a parent. Um, you know, um, your house was on fire when you were a kid. Something happened where that made you feel not safe and it affected you to the point where you, uh, you've internalized it and you think that it had something to do with you. You failed in some way. It's your fault. Or there's something that you have to do for the rest of your life to make sure that it never happens again. You're protecting yourself. So, um, for example, in probably my best selling book ever, it's called After We Fall. Um, this dude had so many problems, like so many problems. <laughs> he ha he was a um, ex army sergeant, so he'd been in Afghanistan. He had a little bit of PTSD. He came home and he got married, and then he lost his wife in this tragic car accident, and he felt guilty about it, like it was his fault because of things that he had done in the during the war. So that like, you, you, it doesn't get any more serious than that. That's a pretty deep wound. So he mm -hmm. had made up his mind that he didn't deserve to be happy. Everything that had happened to his wife was his fault. And um, he was never, he didn't deserve love. 
Um, and that that made that story almost, well, I don't want to say it wrote itself, but that character, I understood him really, really well. I knew that he was, he was a jerk to the heroine when they first met. He couldn't stand her. She was totally different. She was a city girl. He was a farmer. They did not get along at all, but he was attracted to her and he hated that. Um, so that was a really fun dynamic to write between them. Um, but I, I knew where he was coming from and that was a legitimate reason to be afraid of his attraction for her. Like he had already told himself, I, I can't, I don't deserve to be happy. I don't deserve to have love. So um, something like that. I have to know what the wound is before I write the story. And that's a pretty serious one, but it doesn't have to be that, that serious. In the book that I have coming out at the end of the month, um, I was really looking to write a lighter book, like between quarantine and hundreds of thousands of people dying like I just could not write anything super heavy or angsty so I sort of I just gave him a, a bad breakup in his past and, and something had happened and so he he built up his walls and he was like nope I'm out no relationships for me like uh, he has rules in place and then of course a girl comes along and he breaks all his rules for her um well and let me interrupt you for just a second because I do the developmental developmental editing. And so I see the earlier drafts of these things. And when you're talking about having the wound and knowing where they're coming from, what I see a lot of, especially with new writers is I have to have this wound. Okay. I know that his house burnt down when he was seven and he couldn't save his kitty. And so that makes him never want to love anybody again. And then like in the first oh, five pages of the book, the hero is thinking to himself after he meets the woman, well, I can't ever love again because I lost Mrs. Pickles when the house burned down. No, you can't say that. <laughs> Pickles. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how you use the wound to create the emotion without like dumping out their purse on the table? So the thing about the wound is that um, the hero is not aware of it. Like he might say to himself, like, I don't deserve love. And and so I'm not going to like screw this girl. I don't need her or whatever. But the hero is never going to admit, um, especially in the first chapter, eventually at the moment of the intimate reveal, which usually happens, you know, right when the couple is like, it's their highest high. It is their moment where they're really their true selves with each other. They're more intimate with each other. And I don't mean just like sexually intimate with each other. I mean, emotionally stripped bare. He finally tells her about Kitty and he's never told anyone that story ever in his life. Then, okay. But otherwise, the character will never see that as a fear or as a weakness or as a wound. In fact, the opposite. The hero sees that as a strength. You know, I learned, you know, I, I learned to be this way to, you know, maybe because I'm awesome. <laughs> I figured it out. Like, I know how to be happy and live my life or whatever. Um, and maybe, you know, there is the, the gaping wound is there, but they fill it with other things. Maybe they drink or they go out with a lot of women or they're workaholics or they think, you um, you know, they're always chasing after something else to fill that hole. Um, but they're never going to, they're not going to come out and say, I shouldn't say never. They're not going to come out and say right away. Um, I'm afraid of love because I lost my kitty. So no, you, you want to do the opposite. In fact, you want the, the um, you want the hero to think this is, um, this is a strength. He's looking at it. In fact, my my um my Michael Haig notes. Um, he has a really great. So the wound leads to what he calls an emotional shield, and that's those walls that I keep talking about. He calls it a psychological drawbridge, and so it's like what when after that wound happened and they learned to protect themselves against further emotional pain, the drawbridge is up. And it's going to be that heroine that gets the drawbridge to come down. But it is a gradual process. It does not happen right away. In fact, right away, he probably adds another like 50,000 bolts to the drawbridge 
because he's so against opening it up for anyone. Um, the, the hero is going to rationalize those flaws, meaning that gruff exterior and that psychological drawbridge that's up. He's going to see that as strength. Um, and he's just going to pummel her with his strength <laughs> until she basically um, kind of wears him down with her incessant need to get closer to him. Um, and then he'll, you know, layer by layer sort of drop drop the protection and admit to her like, and then maybe he tells her the story of losing his parents in the fire or, you know, or his kitty, whatever, whatever it is. Well, can I so see the point? What's can that? I, can I see us a little bit in a different direction? Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously the wound before you start writing. Because mm -hmm. uh, we always like to ask the plot or pants or question. I know you're not like a, a, uh, a damn dog. Um, I know you're not like a crazy, crazy plotter, but how much do you know before you sit down to write? What do you work out? So people have asked me this question a lot, like, well, what comes first? I'm not an outliner. I have friends that can be like in this chapter, this in chapter two and chapter three, and they know that's not me. So I might want to write um, a friends to lovers. Like that might come first. Like I really want to write a friends to lovers romance. And then I'll start thinking about, well, who is she and who is he and how long have they been friends? Or I might have a great idea for a character. Like with After We Fall, I want I really wanted to write a farmer. And it was sort of an homage to my favorite liberal Spencer book, which was also about a farmer who had, um, his wife had died years ago or whatever. And he was in his 30s. And this girl coming to stay at his house was the local one room school teacher. And she was only 17. So it was an age gap. You know, he was like anti women. He had a son. So he was also single dad. There were all kinds of like good things going on. So I was like, well, what can I take from that story and kind of make it fresh, make it my own? Um, so sometimes the trope comes first, sometimes the wound comes first. Um, but those three things I, I really need to know. I need to know the snapshot of who he is at the beginning and who she is. Why are they stuck? What's, you know, what do they think they want? I know what they really need. And so does the reader right away. As soon as they, you know, are on the page together and be like, oh, they're perfect for each other, obviously. Um, but they just are going to re refuse to believe it. So I know who they are. I know what the trope is. And then I know what the wound is. So um, those those three things. And sometimes if I'm having a hard time getting started, I, ha I ask my character, well, why are you stuck? And what do you think is going to fix it? And then I write a little like letter back to me. And I let them be as mouthy as they want to be. Oh, I'm not stuck. You're crazy. Like I'm doing just fine. You legitimately write a letter to yourself? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love so, that. Yeah. They tell me to F off all the time. Like they don't need <laughs> this story. Um, but then it, it, it lets me hear all of their defenses and then I know where to go with it. I kind of know where to, where to start. And I especially love in that letter, if what's revealed is the thing they think is going to get them unstuck or fix their problem. It's never like, I need to fall in love with a nice man. It's, um, you know, I need, I need a better, I want this promotion at work. I want to land this client. I need to, um, whatever it is. Um, like in the current book that I'm writing right now, he is a single dad. He is a widower and he lives with his mom. He and his daughter, his nine-year-old daughter live with his mom. And he thinks it's time to move out of his mom's house. His best friend is getting married and he kind of is like looking at his best friend's life, like moving forward, moving forward. And he's like, you know, well, I'm not stuck, but I, I do think it's time to move out of my mom's house. I'm going to, I'm going to get my own place and then I'm going to feel better. Um, and I forget who said, oh, K.M. Wyland, Creating Character Arcs is another book that I love. Um, and I can't, I think it was her that said, um, this, the character and the thing that they think they want, like my, my guy who's going to buy his house and that's going to make him feel better. Um, it, they have depression, but they're putting a cast on their arm. So uh, if I think like, you know, that it's the wrong thing, of course, I mean, it could be great. He's going to buy a new house. He's going to love it. But once he gets there. He's not going to feel complete. It's not the house. Um, it's that he's lonely 
and he, you know, need he wants to be connected to someone, wants a companion. Um, I forget what the question was. <laughs> Did that answer it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I think it was what the things that I have in place. So yeah, the things that you know before, before you start. Like that, yep. Uh, the the wound, and then the trope. Those and certain you know wounds lend themselves really well to certain tropes. Um, but really, you can make anything work. And I think what I. I know because this I was this way myself, and I still get this way. And so I imagine that new writers feel this way. There is this voice in your head that says, "But I, I can't do that because everybody has written that book already, and I have to do the most unique, the most outrageous, the quirkiest heroine, like the most outrageous circumstances ever, um, or else people aren't going to buy my book." No, <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Like it is we not, talk about this all the time. Yeah. Yes, no, no, don't do that. To write an original romance. It's it's really not. And even when yeah. readers say, and I love you, readers, don't get mad at me about this. When they say, I want something that I've never read before, it's not true. It's not true. An original romance just isn't possible. What's possible, as um, Jessica Brody says in Save the Cat Rides novel, is fresh. Original is not an achievable goal right. when you're writing a novel, any kind of novel. So just- Nor do you want it to be because how do you market a book that has no no parallels? Where do, where does it fit? Who, oh my who do God, you... that sounds like a nightmare to me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and the, the book you just mentioned. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Can't write a novel. It, it's so, I wrote, I remember, I take notes when I when I read a book. Um, in fact, I open to that page. Original is not an achievable goal in novel writing. What is achievable is fresh. So yes, there have been a million enemies to lovers office romances, but that's also because readers love them. They right. love them. Um, readers want what they know they're going to love. You can give them the same, but different, but, but fresh, you know, it's like baking a cake. They all have sugar, they all have flour, they all have eggs, butter, whatever. But you tweak things here and there and you make it your own, decorate it how you want to, and serve them the cake. They love the cake. People love cake. I mean, just because you've had chocolate cake before doesn't mean you're never going to order it again. I could eat pizza every single night for the rest of my life and yeah. love it. Every exactly. <laughs> um, <love> pizza. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> So let's see, what else do we think we need to know about how to make readers respond uh, immediately? Feeling. So yeah. I think that that um, stop trying to be 1000% unique, quirky, outrageous, that also applies to your characters. The quirkiest heroine in the world isn't going to make your readers fall in love with her. What right. is going to make your characters fall in love with her is that she can't lose the last five pounds or her mother is driving her up a wall, or she's got three kids and she's a single mom and she can't get 10 minutes in the day to, to herself, or she can't stop looking at Instagram pictures of perfect bodies and being like, oh my God, what's wrong with my life? Why is everybody so perfect? And I'm like barely hanging on. Those are the kinds of things that when I'm reading a book, I'm like, Oh my gosh, is she standing over my shoulder, like looking into my brain? Like this sounds like something I have thought a thousand times. So I I know my readers at this point really well. Um, I've even, you know, I know roughly because of Facebook will give you some demographics. Amazon will not tell me anything about my readers. But Facebook, I have a very large reader group and, and it's active and I kind of know from demographics of that group and my, my author page that my reader is a little older, between 35 and 55. Um, for the most part, they have some kids, a, at least a part-time job, at least some college education. So this is a woman I feel like I know really well. And every time I go into a, a writing a book or even writing a scene right down to this level of the scene, I'm thinking to myself, what does that woman want to see in this scene? 
What does she want to hear from this character? How can I better, how can I make this character more relatable for her? Um, and, you know, I, I, I've stopped trying to appeal to the broadest, most mass audience possible. I, I've sort of, I love David Goffrin's From Strangers to Superfans, where he talks about like, you want to build up your tribe of readers. You want to go deeper, not wider. So, and I think that's really good advice and it helped change my mindset like trying to write the story that's going to appeal to the you know huge numbers of readers that's very daunting but when i think about that you know that mom age 45 like i am with her two kids and her job and her husband and she's just dying to get alone with her book at the end of the day i know that woman and, and I can write for her. So I think that um, that is why my readers, I'm able to draw feelings out of them because I, I know them, I know who they are. Um, so I would encourage any, any author, and it's hard when you're just starting out, you don't know who your readers are gonna be. But I would say, even if you're just starting out, it's really helpful to think about your target audience. If you're writing new adult, your audience is probably gonna be younger um, maybe, I don't know. I made that up, but you could I think, think about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you would think about what, a, what a younger reader might be, might be looking for. Um, but I do think that those, those feelings come from relating to the characters and then seeing that character make mistakes. I am not afraid to let my characters make mistakes they say stupid things because they're scared they're not going to admit it but they're scared um and they they uh, you know they have to deal with i let embarrassing things happen to them um they overreact they throw tantrums occasionally um and then they're sorry oh this was something i was going to mention i write a lot of internal dialogue and nancy could probably she probably knows this since she edits all, all my books. And I occasionally worry that it's too much. I'm too in my characters' heads. I'm too thinky. Um, but again, I'm letting my reader in on something that nobody else in the book knows, only the, the hero or only the heroine. So, and I find it really interesting to um, compare what they say and what they do with how they're really feeling in their in their head like and i co-wrote with another author um who was less about the internal and more about you know what they say and what they do and it was interesting trying to kind of meld our our styles and at one point she finally said to me you gotta cut some of this <laughs> it's going on for too long in her head um, and I was like, okay, fine. You know, cause we were trying to melt, match our styles. But when I'm writing on my own, I go to town. I let them have arguments with themselves in their head. Um, you know, I let them explain basically why they just were such a jerk to her so that my reader knows, oh, he's not really a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> he well, not say, or Don talks about that confused. a lot. That <laughs> That's the deep POV that we're always pushing writers to move towards, you know, letting readers really understand that what your characters are saying isn't necessarily the whole story or what they're doing doesn't paint. My the whole God, it is how boring. Like, mm -hmm. no, there's nothing interesting or compelling about someone who says everything that they're thinking, means everything that they say. Like, who does that in real life? You, I mean, I have. I'm always like thinking things I can't say out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> or you can only say them out loud to certain people. <laughs> you gotta be careful when you say them out loud too. Know your audience. That's the right. message here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, but well, I and again, when you're talking about this internal dialogue that they're having with themselves, again, that's not, I'm assuming, not them being self aware of. I was just a jerk to them because my cat died when I was seven. No, as I would say, um, I do have a tendency because of everything that I know about that character to in a first draft, 
let them be too self-aware. But as I go back through, and sometimes I think Nancy may have even called me on this a couple times, like, or maybe like, um, I have a couple readers who read chapters for me, other authors. I have a really good friend, Laura, will read chapters uh, for me and, and he'll be like, he's really self-aware here. I think you have to take that out and let him, you know, just be frustrated and not really even know why. Um, so th there is a, a danger in, in letting them be too self-aware, but no, normally like what he would say is, you know, it's not because my kitty died. He'll just say like, I told her from the beginning, I didn't want this relationship. You know, she knew it from the start and, um, women always do this. They say they're okay with something <laughs> and, you know, he'll look to blame other people, anything, but do the deep dive and admit to himself, like what he really is, is scared of making himself vulnerable. And that you don't want that to happen until that, you know, moment of intimacy, the point of no return. Um, because really that that's going to be what makes him retreat then, in the words of, of Gwen Hayes, you know, I don't write explosions and kidnappings and, um, you know, no one is gonna die in my books. Um, so the, the, the stakes are always the heart. Um, and so usually, even if it's something external in the plot that, that happens, usually that, that panic that makes him retreat is because he realizes, oh crap, I fell in love and I didn't want to, and I don't, you know, I don't want that. I don't want that. So now I got to pull back and, uh, cut her out of my life. <laughs> Because that's the only choice. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, and then he acts. He acts like a jerk, and the reader, it guts them because they know you're being such an idiot about this. No, don't do it. Um, and they make terrible decisions, and um, you know, sabotage their relationships because because they're scared. And then they, you know, they have that long, dark night, which is my least favorite part of a book to write. <laughs> I detest it. I loathe it. And I always want it to be over in like a chapter. And Nancy will be like, you wrap this up really fast, but I get it. You're done. <laughs> I forgive you because I wanted them to get together again. So <laughs> it's just, I hate that part of the book. I'm like, well, how much can she cry? Like, how yeah. much torture can we go through? I, I I did all this work to put them together. And now he's just being a jerk about it. Like, right. So, well, so I guess we maybe should invite those that are watching to ask questions if they have any for Melanie, while we kind of wrap towards the end of all this. Um, sure. I think things pop up sort of real time over here in the comments. So if you do have a question for Melanie Harlow um, about, character specifically, but I guess probably about writing or her career or anything. I'm open <laughs> for anything. Feel free to throw it in there. Um, and then maybe Don, while we sort of hang out to see if anything else is going to pop up, um, we can talk a little bit about what else we've got coming up. You can hear my dog going nuts. Yes. No. no. <laughs> and my I husband walked through and like opened it's nine fine. packages like crap. And I was like, <laughs> um, I was going to say one more thing that I, I didn't want to forget to say. Yes, do. I know um, going into a, a book, what the feelings are that I, I want my reader, like when they close the book, I know how I want them to feel. And I think that's really important as you build toward it. I mean, certainly throughout any story, you're going to have moments of, you're there, I want them to laugh. I want them to be sad at some parts. I want them to be scared at some parts. Um, you know, I don't write suspense or anything, so it's never going to be like that. <gasps> are, are they going to die? But so I want them to have, you know, that kind of all the ups and downs. But in the end, I, I want them to feel like cozy. I want them to feel warm. I want them to feel at home. I want them to feel like oh, this, this story was for me. I belong to this story and it belongs to me. It is my home. And I kind of arrived at that feeling that I really wanted based on reader emails, like what they would say to me. They would say like, um, oh, reading your books, it, it's a, it's a feels like a warm blanket. Or I had a friend say to me, a Melanie Harlow book is like pajamas. 
And I was Aww. like, okay, I, I, I get that. I get that. So that warm, fuzzy, like, yes, there are the sexy parts, but I want that feeling of safety and coziness and home to really be the thing that, that stands out in the end. So I think that that helps going into it. And that will also help with the marketing of a book. Um, when you well, so know- that's sort of when people talk about theme, like that all writers kind of have a theme or a core story, I've heard it called. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the same thing that you're talking about. Like every, <laughs> yeah, maybe it's, it's a brand. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is marketing. Um, it's not, mm-hmm. It, it makes it kind of not as sexy, but when you're talking about knowing who your reader is, you're talking about a persona and yep. anyone that's ever gone through marketing training yep. knows that uh, avatar, you know, <laughs> yep, exactly who you're aiming at. And you almost like draw a little picture. This is Karen and she is, you know, absolutely. That's how it works. Absolutely. Well, and I wanted to, to bring it together a little bit because we did talk about that. We wanted to have you to talk about um, drawing emotions, but also because like you said, that leads to the reader investment that you know how you want that reader to feel at the end of it and how invested they get in the story, which goes back to what you said at the very beginning about already knowing your characters and making your characters be like somebody that people know in real life. Because some of the things that you mentioned you let your characters do of you let your characters make mistakes and you let your characters be embarrassed and you let them um, have tantrums and that kind of thing. The difference there between somebody who will read that and enjoy it and the difference between a reader who starts reading that and it's like, I'm so sick of this character and puts the book down is that reader investment in the fact that we know these characters and it's like, okay, so this is my best friend and she having a meltdown so i have to stay with her until she's done with the meltdown yep yeah and, and who hasn't had a th- that meltdown who hasn't been that woman screaming at her kids in target or <laughs> you got tipsy and texted your crush or you know we we have all been there and and that's what i took the um oh my gosh why can't i think of his name um the the writer and director oh judd aptow he did a master class on um, writing like comedy. And he, uh, he, he said, the more specific you can make it, those, those pain points that you feel, that's what's funny to people. He's like, it's not like the, don't ever think about like what will make the most people laugh. You think about like this thing that's specific to you because that's, that's who your audience is. Um, and so I, like I said, I, I think about, well, I know that that reader. I call her Katie. I know Katie. <laughs> she's an actual reader who lives in Michigan, and she's read like every single one of my books. <laughs> and um, and I think about her a lot when I'm writing. And I and I think, well, what would she find funny, or what's going to make her feel good at the end of this? Yeah. Um, another thing I do for reader investment, and I've done this better with the last series, the Cloverly Farm series, than I ever did before, was I put in little cookies for the next book so that they're ready and waiting and willing to grab it as soon as it comes out. Cause they, they kind of, they know whose story it's going to be mm-hmm. and they are desperate for it. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, I read the first book in that series. I've read it in the past two days <laughs> and um, I had other stuff that had to get done. So if you're my client, I, I was totally focused <laughs> on your, your book. I wasn't just curled up on the couch reading Melanie's book. Um, well, no. I also may or may not have texted Nancy and talked about how I was crying at the end of your book because I like I had to redo my makeup for this because uh-huh. there, there was this really sweet moment and I can't tell you about it, but it was really good. You should read it. Um, but also as I was reading it and meeting all of these other people, I had the same feeling of, oh, I bet this one's going to get a book. And oh, I bet that one's going to get a book. And at the end of the the um at the end of the book, it tells you which book, you know, hey, if you like yeah. this one, get a book. And I was like, oh, well, yes, we have to click on that. Well, so yeah. <laughs> see it works. Back matter authors. <laughs> yeah. But- where you're gonna you're gonna grab a lot of eyeballs that way. So we do have so one question. Totally Go ahead. Getting pretty Go ahead. close to the hour mark here, but Leah says I joined late, so you may have already said this, but what if any pre-writing do you do for your characters? Do you write any part of your character's backstory before diving in? So 
we did cover a lot of that, Leah, um, but I'll let Melanie kind of hit on maybe the high point. Yeah, I don't write a ton of stuff before I get going. I like to kind of get them into a room and see what happens with the scene. I know their ages. I know where they live. I know their jobs. Um, I know, you know, sometimes I know their family situation. Other times I'm like, oh, she has a brother. <laughs> she just started talking about him in this scene. And then you have to go back and write him in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but in general, those are the basic things that that I know. If both characters are going to have a wound, because sometimes both of them do, but usually, like I said before, the hero has the longer way to go. So he he's going to have the deeper the deeper wound. Um, I know what the wound is, and then sometimes if I'm really having trouble, like getting started, um, I, I mentioned this before. I ask them a question. I pretend I'm like, "Why are you stuck? And what's going to get you unstuck in your life?" Because when you start the book you their life can't be perfect obviously and I let them answer that that question and I learn a lot about them that way your subconscious is an amazing place and it, it will if you just let it go um I've been really surprised at how um how much I learn about a character with that initial letter I like that idea I'm probably gonna have to do that do it <laughs> that's, that's a great idea it's <laughs> a great idea all right well, so thank you so much for spending time with us today, oh, Melanie. It's actually having. really, really interesting. Um, we may get some more questions in the comments from people who watch later. So I'm I wonder if we can, yeah. would you pop back in and yeah, okay. absolutely. Very good. And we'll list the books that you recommended in the comments. Laura asked us for that. Um, and then yeah. what do we have? What do we have happening? Stories in the I'm wild proud next week. I have oh yeah, Don. <laughs> Because she didn't have any books last week. This week, she just keeps holding them up. <laughs> so I'm enjoying that. Those are, but I mean, like, you can't, it doesn't get any better than than those two books. Like, if if you had only those two books, and I think the last time I checked, Romancing the Beat was in Kindle Unlimited. Oh, really? I, yeah. Watch me be a liar now. But I oh. think it was. Because I was going to give it to somebody, and... um. And I was like, wait a minute, it's in Kindle Unlimited. And I knew she had Kindle Unlimited. So yeah, definitely um, those those two books, it's all, it's all you need. It's all you need to become Melanie Harlow. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the magic sauce that. right there. Yeah, maybe a little talent too, but. <laughs> all right. So Dawn, uh, next week, please. Okay, <laughs> upcoming. <laughs> um, next week is our, I don't know, I made up a name. I called it Stories in the Wild. Uh, this is where we're going to Very talk exotic. about the stories we've been seeing and what we've been watching, what we've been reading. What have you guys been reading? Not enough. Well, I read Melody Harlow today. <laughs> I read a Melody Harlow book recently. <laughs> Can we count what we're editing? <laughs> so that's going to be our topic next week, talking about picking out stories from other things other than just when you sit down to study a story. Like, what do you pick up on when you're watching things? Good examples of conflict, good examples of um, story, like moving the plot along, pacing, that kind of thing. So I haven't. And then to August something to binge watch is what you're telling me. I didn't hear you say it again. I'm just now I have an excuse to binge watch some stuff because it will be. Oh, for yes, work. absolutely. <laughs> That's, I mean, it's work, right? Yes. Um, and then August 13th, we have Sierra Simone coming to talk about. Yeah. The <laughs> and I love her writing so much. Well, so she, we talked about deep POV just a tiny bit with you. She's going to talk about that um, because. POV? Yeah. As the, the mistress of POV. I mean, she writes from multiple like points of view and, and her stories and somehow makes them all so different. And yeah, no, she's, she's so yeah. talented and a genuinely amazing human. I agree. Well, so are you. And so is Dawn. I just feel honored that I get to spend time doing this. <laughs> what a fun job. Um, and I think that's all we have planned for now. So I guess we better get on that, Dawn, because that only takes us through yes. the next two weeks. Well, we've um, got some people we're still trying to, to lock down schedules on. So okay. We'll definitely get that taken care of. Okay. And we have a couple of classes on Teachable, the deep POV class and the coupon code ends, what's today, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, where are we? It ends on Saturday. 
the coupon okay, code. Okay, yes. The coupon code <laughs> is good through Saturday for the DPMV class. The coupon code is first class, as in I'll put it in, it's all one word. And um, it's a $30 discount. It ends on Saturday. But you have access to the class. Once you buy the class, you have access to the class basically forever. So if you're thinking, I can't get it finished before Saturday, that is absolutely fine. You can go ahead and get the class and get the discount and then work through it whenever you have an opportunity in your schedule. Right. And we talked a lot today about Gwen Hayes and the Elements of Romance class that is up. Is It borrows heavily from that book. And she's credited in there because it is an amazing book. Um, but it's a pretty quick plotting system. If you're a little bit struggling with how to put together your romance plot, you can go take that class. The discount code on that one is SS10. Is that the that are teaching elements of romance? Um, it's a teachable class that I have up on our Teachable Academy. Oh, so that's we're starting to roll out more classes. Um, right now we have those two plus a free one that is a manuscript formatting um, kind of 101, just because we get so many that, you know, have a lot of crazy, <laughs> crazy formatting going on. Um, so it's basically everything I do before I can look at someone's manuscript and that one you can get for free. So that's what's up there for now. Um, and I think that's everything. I have one more thing. Oh, okay. one more thing. That's not everything. Um, we do have an Evident Inc. Pinterest page okay. that I've been working very hard on. <laughs> And we only have five followers right now. So if anybody plays <laughs> on Pinterest and you want to come follow us, if we had like 10 followers by next week, I would be super excited. And I feel bad that I totally don't help at all with that. I, I don't know no, how to do that. It's my favorite place to play. <laughs> I love playing with it. But the, the five followers is making me kind of sad. So I think I'm one if, of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm you. I love Pinterest for research, for books. Love it. So there you go. I'm trying to put a lot of useful resources on there. So if you play on Pinterest, come follow us. All right. I think that's it for us today. Thanks again, Melanie, for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you guys next week. I'm going to hit that button and then we'll sit here for a second. There we go. <laughs>